So this is perhaps my most famous work from 23,000 years ago. <laughs> um, well, as you probably know, I hope you know, this is the Venus of, of Willendorf at the Kunsthistorisches Museum. You can see it, it's a few inches high. But um, nonetheless, she has held an iconic power of the image. And uh, in the years that I was trying to figure out how to make figurative sculpture in a way that would work in a contemporary setting, I came to see that the reason to do a figure was to present an image of humanity and what it meant to be uh, a person. So uh, I tried to learn from history how humans are presented in a way that seems to hold meaning and, um, and say something about the human condition. Well, so one of the great things about that piece is that you have just no idea why she's standing the way she's standing, why she, her face is covered, what was going on in the mind of the sculptor. And yet, here she is, just seeming, with, with her packing a lot of power and speaking to us from uh, the earliest state of humanity. So, uh, but you would, what, what would she mean to us today? What did she mean, what did she mean to the people who were looking at her back then? We don't know. She looks powerful. She has exaggerated female characteristics. She's weighty. She's blind. Who knows? To us, to me, it might look like an image of female, of oppression of the female. She's tied up. She's covered up. Uh, who knows? So um, I take information or I take I take gestures from the past and present them, try to present them as taken by someone in the present. And then I just see what it means. I don't try to impose a meaning upon it myself, but I think that the setting the time that it's in now, whoever is looking at the piece that will interact with the image and produce the meaning. Um, so thinking about icons, different societies, well, let's, take the, the, let's take the idea of the iconic woman, different societies present very different images of the, uh, the epitomal woman. So on the right side, you have um, a sensual beauty that is uh, Satparvati uh, with Vishnu, Vishnu, her man. Oh, Shiva? No, sorry, Shiva. And um, so uh, you, just the, you just see sensuality, curves, lusciousness valued by this society. And then next to her you have <clears throat> the Virgin Mary, motherhood, purity, gracefulness, gentleness. 
Another statement of the uh, role model woman. So um, <clears throat> here, here are two um, modernists. This is a Gaston Lachaise. And he, so here's a more here's personal vision of the iconic <coughs> woman. Lachaise's mother image, also very hefty, powerful, but yet sort of floating. And uh, this is an interesting artist, Ken Butler, who actually got, who became very interesting as he got older and um, clearly has a fetishistic, sexualized uh, view of women. Um, if you look, if you were to see this closely, the, she has doll hair. Um, and I find them kind of interesting as a, as a, uh, some kind of male vision of exaggerated uh, doll-like sexuality. So, as a figurative sculpt, what, what, what it means to be a figurative sculptor is that you use the style of your form to show your attitude about the figure. So, I just wanted to show this. This is uh, lifted from um, a very well-known Kenneth, Kenneth Clark essay where he traces figures with the same iconography done at different periods in culture and rendered in a way that shows different attitude towards their subject. So you have the Greeks with a sort of dignified, almost a cross between mechanistic and sensual. You have a Medieval. Oh, so this is um, this is sort of the Venus Eve iconography. So um, the Greek one is is um, sort of attractively modest. The late medieval one is embarrassed, shameful, <clears throat> and uh, the other one. <coughs> the next one is. Um, um, vanity. And then we have the late Renaissance, which is once again looking towards the classical and showing more pride about the body and um, kind of a, a dignified or um, sort of cool, chic sort of body. So um, this is the Botticelli Venus, and uh, who is the color model for my Eve. Uh, my Eve is sort of a cross between original sin and baby sexuality. And of course, she is also a portrait of a particular child. So um, when I first, but my first series was a series of toddlers and children, babies, and I just want to point out to you the similarities and differences between my style and a Renaissance style. So here you have a little Renaissance terracotta, and he has kind of a fake baby body that's all full of Renaissance curves. Remember, the philosophy of the Renaissance was to portray an ideal realm, the Platonic realm. So they were going for some vision of a perfect world, or a perfect, at least, theoretical world. And so they were looking for the ideal proportions and beautiful curves that um, worked around and around on each other. And uh, as my class might tell you, I'm very interested in the, those kind of resolved curves. However, I'm also extremely interested in how things really look and how the, the body really is. Because 
We are not in an ideal age. We are in an age of truth, individuality, and sort of we are definitely stuck in the hardships of mortality. So um, so this is uh, my baby Jesus who is taken from a real baby. And uh, I try to have them have a foot in both worlds. Only in, in my, so it's as if someone was shot down from the heavens and landed on earth. Uh, so his beautiful curves are bent around real baby proportions. He, his sad expression could be a premonition of the suffering of man, or it could be colic. This is uh, Eve. She's uh, bummed out about her son being crucified. And uh, she is uh, in that medieval sway rather than a contrapposto. St. Francis, taken from that figure over on the left, sort of a, a looking to the heavens or shrugging off responsibility. So, um, once again, I just take the the gestures that are given to me and see what they might mean today. And, and what I would say about their gesture, of course, is as much speculation as what you might say. So this is Chakmu, the uh, bowl of the gesture of the original is meant to hold the beating heart of a sacrificial victim. But uh, in her case, perhaps it's, it's different. The model that I used for this was in Mexico. She was the daughter of uh, a taco seller. And uh, she was the most obedient child model that I had. All the other kids I had were running around. And uh, this one just did exactly what I told her to and sat very still. And I felt like a colonial oppressor. This is Malangan, a uh, New Guinea figure that I had to put together from uh, magazine photographs, since I don't know anyone from New Guinea. But I love the New Guinea masks. and. Um, who knows what they mean? I suppose they're ancestor portrayals um, with some power from some other world. And, uh, you know, it's a cannibalistic society, and I thought maybe he looked like he had a stomach ache or had been jumped out of the jungle to scare a white person. Um, so... This is Guardian. So uh, the method that I use is that I, um, just from looking around, I find an interesting image that might have an interesting take by contemporary standards. And then I look for a model of the correct ethnicity. One of the things that I really enjoyed right just from the start of this series was how realistic the um, prototypes were in terms of what people look like. So, uh, you know, I, I researched some an Aztec figure or something, and then, you know, the busboy in the restaurant would look exactly like it, and I'd be, oh my God, it looks, this is realism. This is not, you know, you think, you might think that an African sculpture is very abstract, but uh, very often the way the body is divided into volumes is extremely apt for what people's bodies look like. 
in a particular tribe. And it's just kind of cool. People definitely create gods in their own image. I mean, just look at the Jesuses that are around Salzburg. They do not look like the uh, Arabs that they once, that Jesus probably was. So, um, so all of these different, there are a lot of figures, and um, I have some books along. So um, if you want to see everything, you can look in the book. Um, they were published by this academy, and they're for sale down in the office. Um, I, so I have a lot of these individual figures that all have their topic. But for exhibition, I can combine them in different ways to make little essays. So this installation is called Cinderella, Vir Virgin Mary, and St. Teresa. And it's just three different kind of girls. Um, St. Teresa is from the Bernini. Cinderella is from early storybook illustrations. And you've seen the Virgin Mary's prototype. So I um, like to exhibit just on the floor with no pedestal. When I was uh, growing up as an art student in the late 70s, it was a big deal to have gotten rid of the pedestal and have the work of art confront the viewer in his own space. And um, so I have to say I, I have a, in a natural taste for that sort of thing. And um, I like the way uh, it, can, it sets up a, a conflict in the viewer where uh, my work definitely looks very much like art. It's very contrived looking. And it's painted like paintings. It's not really painted realistically. Um, but also they're real enough for people to feel guilty about inspecting them. They feel more like they should throw a blanket on top of Cinderella and protect her from being cold and being exposed. So um, I can put people, sort of wrap them all up in their own attitudes and really make them confront the way that they approach a naked body or a small child or just, um, or form. The context, so here I have these figures that are very much their own individuals, but um, the context that they're in really can change the meaning. In this um, show in Kunstberg, Berlin, a while back, it's a, it's a big, big, chilly art space, and Cinderella looks especially vulnerable, especially worried about how perfectly she is curtsying, how neat her hair might be, how she looks, a very uh, contemporary self-consciousness. And um, so she has, a, I think that would be like 18th century hair. I always research the hair. That's my moment of real research um, so that I can, um, uh, along with the pose, sort of dress the pieces in something that refers to their origins. You know, the modernist nude is uh, stripped of such references. And uh, the artists of the modern era were really interested in universal and sort of universal but sort of personal uh, representation of the body, very devoid of the animal qualities, natural sexuality, or anatomical idiosyncrasies. And I like to refer to that universality. In fact, since my figures are brought together from many different worlds, their nakedness 
really unites them into the world of art and places them all together sort of in the same room of the nude. And yet their hair and their pose, their specificity of race and individuality separates them. So here's a, another installation, so sort of same idea, very um, present on the floor, person can walk in between them, see these contrived children. That's um, Sphinx here, um, courtesan from a uh, sort of Chinese erotic porcelain of 19th century, and um, also from archaic uh, Chinese tomb figures, dancing. Delilah from a Van Dyke, also in the Kunsthistorisches Museum. Attila and Olympia. Uh, there, here's a, so here's an, a different kind of installation. I'm not always allowed to put things on the floor. In that case, I put them on pedestals that, uh, I don't know, kind of refer to some vague sense of where they might have come from. And the way that I place them is, is as if I had put a child on the pedestal and then it moved. So I don't just center them. I have them kind of relating to the sides of the pedestal as if it's a, a little stage. Now this is the first installation, it's 2000, that I actually conceived of before I started working on the pieces. So I made all these pieces together, or well not together, over the course of a couple, hmm, three years. And uh, so you can see that there's a little less variety, so I lose out on variety and um, give the installation a little bit more coherence. And this is called Satyr's Daughters. And you have uh, ideal women of different societies up high on pedestal, and then you have the nature guy playing his flute. The girls seem kind of, are kind of spaced out, but listening to the call of nature, perhaps. Um, I, I have um, very subtle feminist tendencies in that art historians are constantly referring to women as a symbol of nature. And I'm like, well, you know, from my point of view, I think men are a symbol of nature. They seem to me much more instinct driven than women. However, so, so um, I get to make installations about that. And here is the Seder guy looking up at the, looking up at the girls. He is, of course, on the ground, and as such, he is a foil for the viewer. He's just the viewer's side. And um, he's kind of a regular looking guy, not really built like a Greek god. I did a little research. Uh, maybe we have a picture of him no? here. So he, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to him later. Um, so here are the here are the prototypes from various cultures. This is Onile. From um, there, there might be an Onile pair outside of a house. It means the owner of the house. And her gesture is one of presenting female attributes. She, in the original, she would just she would be holding her breasts, uh, and she is. Well, let me step back and say that uh, uh, one culture's ideal, viewed from outside, might be considered a stereotype. viewed from another, another point of view. So I like to work with the crossover 
between a cultural ideal and a stereotype. So O'Neely is kind of the feisty black girl with rhythm. Um, Rapunzel, the delicate white girl, delicate European. We have the Lakshmi, sensual Indian, and um, court lady, the submissive Asian. And here are some of the prototypes. And here is the satyr. So I, um, he's actually not exactly a satyr prototype. I couldn't find one. It turns out that um, I, to get the right image, I did research on Greek pottery. And um, the satyrs are little round-headed bald guys, little tubby. And they, they turn out to look like... Um, Native Crete, the native guys from Crete. There are these little round guys with little noses. And um, it's the centaurs that have a, have a big nose. By the Renaissance, those images were combined and they were giving satyrs big noses. And, um, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure this was where the devil got his image. So this is a partner installation to that one. It's um, called Power Figures. So I have four, I, four different types of power dude with the old uh, ancient mother type in sort of a face-off. I have, um, this is a divine warrior, another sort of guardian type, tomb guardian kind of guy. Um, Nikandi, he would be holding a knife and he would have a, he would have a medicine box at his belly that he would be holding. So, uh, and uh, that's, my, that guy, the, the European is a cross between a Russian icon and a photograph of Rasputin. And um, then um, Ayatollah on the far side in a very typical um, uh, Mullah lecturing pose. If you ever see on TV when they're trying to make a point, they're going... Um, and he's holding a book. So it's kind of, um, it's kind of uh, the fighter, the ruthless, the uh, mesmerizer, and the ideologue. There are prototypes. So um, you can see that sometimes I, I like to take the images from uh, from flat art. So um, you know I I'll turn them sideways to to mimic the way that they that like those feet are always seen from the side in Persian drawings. And here's uh, Venus. Her hat does come off. And here's the installation. And um, once again, there she is with her iconic prototype. So um, after the next thing I, I did was I decided I wanted to go the other way instead of expanding into sort of political considerations, I wanted to dive into the psyche of an individual a little bit more strongly and um, sort of get to the inside, both menti mentally 
and physically. So um, this is a great old anatomical figure. I think they call her the medical Venus or something like that. She's in Florence. She was in a show about painted sculpture at the Getty, and I got to see her in person. So I'm going to step back before I show you about that stuff. And this is this is a little wall of little things that I made in around 1992. And um, they were I just some mood came over me, and I just started making um, whatever popped into my mind um, with without any rules. So I stole images, I copied things, or I made them up, or um, Whatever. <clears throat> they didn't take very long. They were about, they spent, you know, they took me, you know, two days each maybe. Here are a few close-ups of them. And um, a lot of them are, they were, they amused me. I was interested in um, the kind of imagery and form that grosses us out, but yet it's like, that's gross. Let me look at that. <laughs> And, um, you know, a, a lot, there are a lot of these kind of animals in nature where you're like, ew, ew. And, and I've always kind of liked them. I remember when I was a little kid, we had a pet praying mantis called Mickey Mantis. If you're not American, you might not get that joke, but there was a anyway, famous baseball player. <laughs> and and I would hold him on my finger, and I remember his uh, thor- his abdomen would be like, pulsing and almost touched me and I'd be like, ooh, ooh. Anyway. (laughs) And uh, so this is how they were displayed originally. And uh, this is how they were displayed recently um, along with this uh, show that I'm going to show you where I actually finally, after, you know, 18 years, Made some larger fetish, made some larger fetishes. But in the meantime, I just wanted to show you that some that the sensibility of the fetishes was feeding a little bit back into the work. Um, whereby, you know, there are a lot of uh, sort of mysterious and fleshy parts of the body that are interesting that way. That might be a little ooey that you don't, well, you don't see them, you don't see a lot of ooey in children, but certainly as you get older, you see more and more of it (laughs) in yourself and your friends. And there's, you know, that's interesting to me too. So I'm becoming more interested not just in that beautiful geometrically curved flesh of the child, but in that, um, in the more complicated things that happen uh, in animal flesh or, or in just as the material nature of the flesh takes over with the mortal condition. Um, this, of course, is not this, of course, is a beautiful young girl, just about, just on the cusp of adolescence. And uh, so it's kind of about the projection of meaning onto another, onto another person and uh, the effect that that has on the viewer and on the viewed sort of, um, she seems both frightened and frightening. And this is what I meant about sort of having this fetishy sensibility seep in and in, um, in the shape of the fingernails and the hair. So her, um, the, the um, advance of sexuality is kind of showing up in her hair. And um, so I do work on the hair sort of as a sculpture to 
just kind of reminiscent, although, you know, I have to say the hair is pretty realistic, too, but you can start seeing how hair takes on a sensuality of its own, and it's been very important throughout the history of culture. People, all different cultures have had very elaborate hairdos, and I wonder if it's not something subconscious. So um, this is... Uh, Snow White, the Disney version, and the seven little dwarfs who are, you know, those dwarfs are kind of weird. So um, you might remember the story of Snow White. Her, her, uh, the, her mother, the queen, was sewing in the winter one day, and she pricks her finger with the needle and a drop of blood falls into the snow, and she thinks, huh, maybe I should have a child. <laughs> and um, so, so um, she, her, um, the king that she's pining for evidently must have come back, at least for, for a few hours or so, because she did, um, she did have a, have a daughter. This is the story with Mirror, Mirror on the Wall, who's the fairest of them all. And her daughter, as she got older, started becoming more beautiful than her mother. Her mother became very jealous. The mirror told her that she was losing her beauty to another. And she took out a contract on her daughter there was a, a hunter was supposed to take her out into the woods, kill her, and uh, rem, you know rip out her liver and show it to her mother as proof that he'd killed her. Um, and um, she was Snow White was so charming he couldn't do it, so he gave him gave showed the mother a pig's liver, and then she made a few more murder attempts. After oh yeah, Snow White ran away and was stuck in the woods for years with seven little inappropriate men. <laughs> and few, finally, finally, the mother uh, is makes a successful attempt, and Snow White is poisoned and gets an apple stuck in her throat, and gets the poison apple stuck in her throat, and is um, in a coma. And um, so she's placed in a glass coffin on display. Here the Disney version is not quite accurate because what happens in the original Grimm's uh, fairy tale is that a prince comes by, loves the way she looks, buys her in the coffin, sets the coffin up in his dining room so that he can eat with her, beautiful, quiet woman. What's wrong with that? <laughs> and um, and uh, his servant, by mistake, knocks over the coffin, and the apple jumps out of her mouth, and she becomes alive again and gets to have the fulfilled life. <laughs> the... Um, the um, <laughs> The Disney version is a little bit more iconic because she is, you know, just lying there in a coma. Who knows what's on her mind, what she's dreaming of. She's just an adolescent girl. What's, what's in her future? I, this is, I'm thinking, like, what is going on in the dream world of this adolescent girl who is waiting for the kiss of the prince to awaken her? Here are some more glass coffin images that I found actually in uh, in Vienna. I did I found some of the oldest illustrations. They're not that old. Illustrating stories is not that old. It's uh, it's late 19th century at the earliest um, with printing. The Grimm's brothers only we did this anthropological research into old German folk tales in the late 19th century. Anyway. So here's my Snow White on her glass coffin that is kind of doubling as a pedestal. Her hair is taken from um, medieval princess 
hairdo. And um, she's just a very beautiful, quiet shell. And she is surrounded by um, seven little figures that are sort of confabulations of medieval clothing, sex, guts like livers, and uh, dwarfs, the little perky, perky friendly dwarfs. So here's some medieval clothing. Just love cod pieces. This is from Bruegel. This is from the what, Bruegel wedding dance. So yeah, each, so each dwarf has the same clothing and the same anatomy. Um, here are some um, form sources for those dwarfs because they're very animal and visceral. This is lust. Oh yes. This installation is called Snow White and the Seven Sins. So the dwarfs are, or the sins are playing the role of the dwarfs or vice versa. Lust, greed, sort of looks like uh, intestines, kind of money bags at the same time. Sloth, kind of like a guy with a beer belly sitting in front of the TV. <laughs> Envy, very sneaky. Gluttony, cross between sort of like a caterpillar and a sharpe. Um, pride or vanity. I just love when, like, um, you know, and how it, with journals, the breasts, like, stick up like that. I just love that. I could, I've never had the courage myself. But, right. um, anger. And there's Snow White again. Very pure on the outside. A different installation, and this is a, another kind of installation at the, the museum in Hawaii. So um, that's it for the finished work. I'm just going to show you a little bit from my studio because I thought you might be curious as to what I'm working on now. Um, I'm still going on the surrealist bent and looking at. Um, you know, gross animals. Um, I love the way um, you know people. People say, "Oh my God, they look like genitalia," and I'm like, "You know, you have that wrong. Genitalia look like worms. <laughs> worms were here first, and." That quality about them, you know, evolution does not make mistakes. That quality about them was preserved for some reason. There was some, there's something attractive about that primitive thing. So this is my first little, I was just starting to make worms. I'm experimenting here. And uh, once again, I like to make a, um, try to put together a coherent anatomy and stick to it and, and put it in different poses because um, I, I find it's better to have a few rules. And this is um, a little exhibition of the first worms. Um, so the installation I'm thinking of is going to be called Out of Water. It's a uh, sea creature related exhibition. So I'm gonna have uh, a mermaid a human mermaid with some worm escorts. Um, and um, the uh, sort of the art critics, the intellectuals in the room will be cephalopods. 
It's an octopus. This is a cuttlefish working on a squid. There's another, there's a big octopus, standing octopus. That's the mermaid in the background and my crammed little studio. Mermaid is kind of, is very interesting looking. She has a very mild birth defect, which makes her a little round. She has short uh, clavicles and um, she has those double jointed hands and, and kind of big feet like a flipper. So, and um, she's and she's very soft, so she's not at all a conventional beauty. Um, um, here's another. Uh, it's kind of a dowager. Here's some more worm escorts. Oops. So. There you go. Any questions? You know, the the U.S. has sort of caught up to Europe because um, I found that the Europeans who are more comfortable are more comfortable with nudity, and they were just able to see uh, just more of the whole meaning of the work. Whereas at first, the reviewers were all about, "Oh my God, naked children." Um, so, yeah, the Europeans were just a little more sophisticated, I would say. Yeah, there was a different reaction. The, the, like the U.S., they kind of caught up a little bit as far as the criticism goes, although, you know, sometimes I get horrified people. <laughs> Mm-hmm. You know what? I'm I'm like a I'm a doctor. I'm like a doctor. I just don't see it anymore. If you just <laughs> if you're and also my class will tell you that I don't even see features when I sculpt. I'm just looking for the form because if you if you are conscious of exactly what you're what you're looking at, you're going to see it less truthfully, sort of. Um, so, uh, most of the time while I'm working, I'm just, it's just form. Um, you know, I may go back and try to emphasize something or other a little bit um, because of the, I want, I want it to be seen, but I'm trying to stay objective and really just, really just make it the way it is. But no, you know, when I come in my studio, first of all, I don't have a child in my studio. I have a child in my studio for an hour or so, brought over by their mother, and that's usually enough for me. I photograph them and work, and just work from photographs. So a lot of the photographs are just parts of bodies. Mm-hmm. Did you actually make, uh, or did you actually start making this uh, news of children to, uh, with the intention of shocking people? Or oh, you know what? Not, not Here's the thing. Shocking to, to, to give people the feeling you, you were talking about. Ooh, uh, mm, you know what? Here's the thing. My first idea with the kids, with the children, was I'll, I'll give you the context of my art education where um, I was being taught sculpture by a modernist, um, actually a guy, an old German guy, 
who is into abstracting the body. And um, there was a lot of controversy, there was a lot of derision of figurative sculpture by the really cool conceptual types who were ruling the sculpture department. So I knew that I had to think very long and hard to justify making a nude because a nude was considered the most boring, conventional 19th century thing. And nobody thought about it as risky at all. It was the opposite. So um, my first intention in doing children was to try to get around convention to get around the convention of the modernist nude, which was very um, sort of stripped of any controversy. It was very desexualized. It was clean, very cleaned up. Or else you might have figures, uh, uh, you know, you'd, on the other side of nudes, then you'd have, you know, very kitschy, sexy girl sculptures, and those I definitely wanted to avoid. So I wanted to really just show something as it was, like an, as a, a body as it was. I mean, if you, if you talk to mothers, and the, they look at their little babies and they think they're just, you know, they're beautiful, look at this hand, look at this leg, look at this tushy, you know, it's just beautiful, and they're not thinking about sex at all, and I really wanted to just have a very pure approach like that, a pure and intimate approach, because the modernist nude is very cold and forget it, for, forbidding in a way, and um, the sexy girls are too intimate in another way, and I was, was, I was doing them to really avoid something and bring people closer to the sculpture in the same way. On the conceptual level, I began to become interested in role models. So I was just, um, child, the controversy of child nudity did not even exist until the late 1980s when there were a few, I forget why, there were some pederasty scares of some kind and then suddenly it became an issue. And um, so it was kind of interesting. The world shifted around my work and I decided, I made the decision to just stick to what I was doing and let the context of the world change the meaning of the work as it would. So in a way, I've just like sort of stayed dumb. I've played dumb. I just keep doing what I'm doing. My children are busy with their role playing and they're concentrating on their own thing. And we, the voyeurs, are thinking whatever thoughts we have. And I let the meaning come that way. I don't take responsibility for it because I think everyone has their own mind and they know what they project onto others. Okay, so, so everyone's satisfied? Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.